This wonderful game of Bobby Fischer was recommended by one of the Chess Dog viewers, and I'm very glad they did recommend this game. This game was played in 1957 at the U.S. Chess Championship, and in this game, Fischer plays a mind-boggling tactic that looks impossible, but it really is an optical illusion and is, in fact, quite brilliant. Now, his opponent is James Sherwin. If you're familiar with Fischer's history, then you know James Sherwin is his first opponent in his book, My 60 Memorable Games. But this is not that game. This is from a different event. And uh, again, the same, a similar opening, but not exactly the same. Let's jump right into this amazing performance from Bobby Fischer. He has white in the U.S. Championship in 57, and Sherwin had black in this game. So e4, c5, knight f3, d6, and very quickly we have an open Sicilian on the board. Those familiar with the My 60 Memorable Games uh, game between these two players realized that uh, Sherwin played e6 in the Sicilian in that game. But here he plays Fischer's favorite, the knight or Sicilian, and then Fischer plays bishop to c4, which was his favorite move against the, uh, the Sicilian, aiming directly at this vulnerable f7 square, vulnerable because only the king defends it. So black plays e6, which is normal to limit the mobility of that bishop on c4. Fisher castles, and now b5, gaining space, but also hitting that bishop with tempo. Fisher plays the bishop back to b3. And the most vulnerable point in Fisher's position is this pawn on e4. Black has something of a vulnerable king. He's not castled yet. White is. White has a lead in development. But this pawn is vulnerable, vulnerable for, uh, for Fisher, and Black is aiming right at it. If he could dislodge this knight on c3, this pawn would become undefended. So he does that. He plays b4. And the most common these days here is knight to a4, but Fisher plays the knight back to b1. From here, it might be able to reroute itself from d2 into c4. Also, it could support a c3 or an a3 push. But at the moment, this pawn on e4 is undefended, and it probably was best for him to bite the bullet and go ahead and take that pawn. Uh, it's a central pawn, which means it's a little more valuable than the other pawns. And after rookie one, bishop b7, uh, Fisher would... Uh, Black, sure, when I should say, would probably have equalized here, although it would be a very tough fight. Uh, but he's a little, probably a little afraid to take that pawn, so he plays bishop to d7, preparing to activate his knight on c6. Bishop to e3 from Fisher. Now knight to c6 is played from uh, by Sherwin. And finally, f3. Fisher goes ahead and defends the e4 pawn with the pawn at f3. There is a downside to that move. It does weaken some of these uh, dark squares, however, around his king. Uh, but now bishop to e7 from Sherwin. And if we look at Black's formation, it's clear that he's done fine. He pretty much has an equal game here and uh, can be very happy with his opening. All of his pieces developed one move away from castling. Fisher plays c3, trying to liquidate this space advantage and uh, develop his knight to c3. Black could have played a5, keeping that knight bottled up, uh, but instead, he does go ahead and uh, take, allowing Fisher. Well, oh, excuse me. If Fisher plays knight to c3 here, then Sherwin could play knight to a5, hitting that bishop at b3. If the bishop moves, he hops into c4. So because of that, Fisher plays the intermezzo knight takes c6 first. Then after bishop takes, knight takes c3. Black castles and rook to c1. We see Fisher setting up potential discoveries against this bishop on the c attack on the c file. Uh, when the knight moves. And in this position, black's strategic goal is usually going to be to play d5. Uh, that's really, Black can get in d5 comfortably. He's doing fairly well. So here Sherwin plays queen to b8 with the apparently the idea to play queen to b5, excuse me, b7 or b5 to help support the d5 push. Seeing that, Fisher plays an interesting idea to prevent d5. He plays the knight directly to d5 revealing this rook's attack on the bishop at c6. If black takes with the knight, counterattacking this bishop at e3, so the knight would have to be taken. Pawn takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, pawn takes. And here, uh, black would have pretty much an equal position. White could play b3 to keep the queen from taking on b2. Uh, and here, with the, these pawn weaknesses, the position is fairly, fairly equal. Uh, but instead, Sherwin goes ahead and takes Fisher's knight with his pawn. 
Now rook takes c6, regaining that piece, and Fisher has captured the bishop pair, so that's a little strategic edge for him. Sherwin takes on e4, Fisher takes back, and here knight to e4, then bishop to d5, attacking the knight, sets up all kinds of uh, discoveries against the rook at uh, a8. If the knight goes back to f6, then rook to b6. The bishop would defend the rook, attacking the queen, and uh, Fisher would attack that rook at a8 and would win material. So instead, Sherwin plays queen to b5, counterattacking that rook that way. Now rook to b6 kicks the queen. The queen goes to e5, and the queen looks pretty strong on this e5 square, but uh, the queen's actually quite vulnerable there, and Fisher can gain tempos by attacking it, which he does immediately with the bishop to d4, and we see Fisher's bishops sweeping uh, in the middle of the board. Queen to g5. Now here, Fisher plays queen to f3, and that move turns out to be imprecise. Fisher did have a stronger move here that he missed, and that's rook to b7, directly attacking that bishop on e7. If the bishop moves back, then Fisher could play e5, and after pawn takes bishop to c5, directly attacking the rook at f8. If the rook moves, he plays bishop takes f7 check, and this wins material. So the, an alternative is rook f to e8, but then just bishop to a4 hits the defender and pushes it away from the bishop. But instead, Fisher played queen to f3, building up on the king side. Knight to d7 attacks the rook at b6, sets up a challenge on this diagonal, and the knight could settle in on e5, which would be a very nice square for that knight. Rook to b7 counterattacks, hits that knight on d7. The knight goes into e5, attacking the queen at f3. Um, now, Fisher could go ahead and take that knight with his bishop, um, but now, you know, he's lost the bishop pair. The structure is a little more solid in the center for black. White's still better with the queenside pawn majority, but not as much better as he would like to be. So he goes ahead and plays queen to e2. And also, this f5 square might be a place for this rook to land, harassing the queen. So bishop to f6, challenging uh, the bishop on the long diagonal. Um, here, if rook to f5 looks like a good move, right, attacking the queen, uh, but then Sherwin would have this nice retort, knight to f3, check, and after rook takes f3, bishop takes d4, check, and uh, this is an equal position. The bishop pair is gone. You have opposite colored bishops. So Fisher plays king to h1 to avoid that knight f3, check, so now that's not available. a5, bishop to d5, aiming at the rook at a8. The rook goes to c8, but with all kinds of potential trading of heavy pieces on the c1 square, rook to c1, the queen would defend it. So bishop to c3 blocks the c-file and attacks the a5 pawn. The pawn advances. Fisher plays rook to a7, attacking the pawn from behind. Notice this bishop controls this square, so this rook cannot go to a8. Now here, knight to g6 is probably the best move. It looks bad at first, because after bishop takes pawn takes, black's pawn structure is a disaster, but he in fact is pretty close to equal here uh, because this knight can has access to these dark squares, and the knight would be quite a bit better than the bishop. Uh, so this is probably an equal position despite all appearances. But instead, Sherwin plays the move knight to g4 with uh, maybe he could play h5 and really generate some pressure against white's king. Um, here, Fisher goes ahead and takes on a4, but this allows black to, uh, to equalize after bishop takes. Instead, the stronger move turns out to be bishop to d2, hitting the queen, and after queen to h4, threatening mate on h2, h3 kicks the knight, knight e5, then bishop to c3, and Fisher can still go ahead and take on a4 uh, without uh, the negatives of the position when he takes it directly, which we will see here. Bishop takes, pawn takes. And now rook takes c3, which looks obvious. The pawn is hanging, you take it, but a stronger move was h5, giving the king room to breathe. So what is wrong with this move, rook takes c3? Well, no doubt, Bobby Fischer's next move was a shock to James Sherwin. I doubt very seriously he saw this move coming. It's this move. Boom, rook takes f7. Very strong. Now, the rook cannot be recaptured, because then just rook to a8, and it's a back rank mate. Black can only delay it a couple times by blocking with his rook, blocking with his queen. 
But since this uh, rook is pinned, it creates a back rank mate and black loses. So instead, Sherwin plays a rook to c1 check. Now this does create problems. Well, what if white plays the move rook back to f1 with a discovered check against the king? That looks decent. It is actually a, a losing move. All black has to do is play king to h8, and that's it. After uh, rook takes c1, queen takes c1, and that's just a simple mate in the back, on the back rank. Um, if instead bishop to c4 to try to keep control over this f1 square to prevent the back rank mates, then black can just play queen to e5, threatening mate on h2, and there are just too many threats, and he's winning. If g3 to defend h2, then just taking on f1, and, uh, and that's it. Yeah, he would just lose very quickly. So because of that, Fisher has a much stronger move than rook to f1. At first, it looks impossible but in fact is brilliant, and this was it. Queen to f1. And it makes all the difference. He's giving up his queen, but he has a much stronger position here. If rook takes queen with check, then just rook takes queen, discovered check, and after the king moves h8, it's made on the back rank. If rook takes, then rook to a8 is a back rank mate also. What if the queen get, takes the bishop? Well, then just rook takes check, king takes, pawn takes. And Fisher would be up in exchange and a pawn. A very, very po powerful idea. So instead of taking the queen, Sherwin plays h5, giving his king some room to move to go to h7 if need be. Queen takes c1 from Fisher. If queen Take c1 with check, then again, rook to f1, discover check, and attacking the queen after king h7, rook takes c1. White would be up an entire rook. And if queen to h4, with a threat of mate on h2, which is actually what was played in the game, then rook to f8, check. Now, black could take on f8, but this would lose instantly. The queen to c8, check. King to e7, rook to a7, check. King to f6, and the final mating move would be queen to f8 mate. So because of that, this wins decisive material. But James Sherwin played on. He played king to h7. h3 kicks the knight out. Queen to g3. Now, he's threatening mate here. He knows he's going to lose the knight, but he wants to use this pawn to create maybe some threats for a, a perpetual check. Pawn takes knight. Now h4, threatening to come to h3. It's not enough, of course. Bishop to e6 from Fisher, And in this position, Black did resign, the reason being if he plays h3 with the uh, easily dealt with threat of mate on g2, Fisher would just play bishop to f5 check. And the king can't move to h6 because this queen covers it, which means g6 would be forced, and then rook to a7 would be mate. Really an amazing game, particularly that queen to f1 move looks uh, impossible at first sight, but a head-spinning and brilliant game from Bobby Fischer against an old rival, James Sherwin. Hope you've enjoyed it. See you again soon at Chess Talk. Goodbye.